Hi, in this video we're looking at empirical and molecular formulas, and I'd like to start just by detailing the different types of formulas. So let's look at this as an example just to begin with. This is something called butane, or C4H10, and you can see that there are four carbons there kind of creating a little carbon chain, and then off of each carbon there are two or three hydrogens three on the ends and then two in the middle ones. Well, this is something that's called a structural formula because this type of drawing or representation shows the structure of a substance. But that's kind of time consuming. Although it shares some great information about what this thing actually looks like, it is time consuming. And so there's a faster way, and we're probably used to this way more than a structural formula, uh, is just to write out how many atoms for each element there are in a regular formula, which we would actually call a molecular formula. So C4H10 shows that there are four carbons and 10 hydrogens in this substance. The, uh, the good thing about this is that it takes far less time than to draw it out. The bad thing though is, is it doesn't share as much information about the structure, the actual appearance of the substance. And that can matter if we're interested in uh, looking at how this might be polar, or you know, how this molecule might interact with other substances. So both of these types of formulas have their pluses and their minuses. We're probably more used to the molecular formula way and that's far more useful in chemistry because it's easy to write and it's easy to type out. But there is one more type of formula and it's more related to the molecular formula. If, I, as you're looking at those subscripts, if you're able to reduce those subscripts down simplify them so that they're maintaining the same proportion between elements, but also showing the, the smallest collection of whole number subscripts, then that's what we call an empirical formula. And for something like C4H10, I can divide the four by two and the 10 by two, and that would get me C2H5. I can't go any lower with a two and a five. There's nothing I could divide both of those by to get me a smaller uh, set of subscripts, but still maintain the same uh, proportion. And so that's how I know that that's the empirical formula. Now, at first, this is a little tricky because you're thinking, well, it's not C2H5, it's C4H10. They're very clearly four carbons and 10 hydrogens. And you're absolutely right. Um, but C2H5 is just the proportion between uh, atoms of the elements in the substance. It's not directly representing uh, what that substance is. So an empirical formula is the lowest whole number ratio between atoms in a molecule. I gave you this example of C4H10. I could reduce those by dividing by some number, in this case the number is 2, uh, to make it C2H5. But, you know, if both of those numbers were divisible by 3 or 4, you'd divide by that factor too. Essentially, you just want to keep dividing those subscripts until you can't divide anymore until you have the lowest whole number ratio, and that's your empirical formula. Now, it's uh, actually fairly common for a substance's molecular formula to also be its empirical formula. Water is a good example of that. <clears throat> but how does this help us? What do we actually do with empirical formula? Well, a lot of times chemists are asked to identify a substance. And so using equipment, uh, namely a mass spectrometer, uh, we can take a substance, put it into a mass spectrometer, and it'll tell us what the empirical formula is. Or it'll tell us the proportions between the elements. And from that information, we could then figure out what the molecular formula is, as long as we know the molar mass of the substance. So let's have this example of a carbon with three moles of hydrogen. Well, that proportion there would result in an empirical formula of C1H3, which again, we don't write one subscript, so that would just really become CH3. And once we know that that's the empirical formula, we have all these other possibilities of what this substance's molecular formula could be. C2H6, C3H9, C4H12, C5H15. If you notice, they have all the same proportion between carbon and hydrogen, but they are very different substances. Um, what they do share, though, is that proportion and that means they also share the same empirical formula, CH3. So how do we figure out what an empirical formula is if we're given information like this? It says a compound was found to contain 0.337 moles of N, 
that's nitrogen and 0.674 moles of oxygen. What is the empirical formula? Well, what I would do in this problem is start by listing out the elements that you have. We've got nitrogen and oxygen. Uh, nitrogen says that it, uh, there is 0.337 moles present for oxygen, 0.674 moles present. Now, our goal with this information is to try to figure out what the lowest whole number ratio between these two elements is. And you can very clearly see that these are not whole numbers. So the fast way to do this is to divide all of these numbers, in this case both of these numbers, but if there are more than two, all of them, by the smallest amount of moles. So in this case, that's 0.337. So if I divide 0.337 by 0.337, I get 1. And then I'm going to do the same thing down here. And you maybe are able to see that that's 2, because this is exactly half of that. Um, now what I've done is I've, I've taken these numbers and I've just figured out what the proportion is, but in a whole number sense. And so knowing that this is N1O2, I can therefore say that the empirical formula is NO2. Now it could be that this substance is actually NO2, um, but it could also be that this substance is N2O4 or N3O6 or N4O8, uh, but the empirical uh, formula at least for this substance is NO2. So that's kind of the level one process of how to figure out an empirical formula if a problem gives you mole information. But sometimes they don't give you mole information, sometimes they give you masses. So let's check out this problem. This one says, a lab test on a compound indicates its element composition, 15.85 grams of carbon. Oof, grams. So that's not already in moles. Grams is a mass. And so we want to convert that to moles because moles will tell us how many atoms of carbon would be in this substance. And then it also tells us that there's 42.24 grams of oxygen. So here's the idea. We want to convert mass into moles. Once we've done that for each of the elements, it's just like the last problem. We just find the smallest mole amount, divide everything by that, and that should give us our empirical formula. So um, I'm a big fan of kind of organizing the work so that you can keep everything nice and clean. It's, it's helpful to see where everything is. So I tend to list this out by element. So here's carbon. I want to convert 15.85 grams of carbon uh, into moles of carbon. So I'm just going to set up a factor label method. Grams of carbon on the bottom, using your periodic table, you can see that 12.01 grams of carbon is the mass of one mole of carbon. So now I can cancel out grams. And visit my calculator for a second. 15.85 divided by 12.01. 1.32 is what I got. So 1.32 moles of carbon. And then I want to do the same thing for oxygen, but I'm just going to use oxygen's mass instead of carbon's. So 42.24 grams of oxygen, a mole of oxygen on top. A mole of oxygen weighs about 16.00 grams of oxygen. Um, good news about these types of problems too is that you don't have to focus so much on significant figures because you're just trying to figure out what the whole number relationship is between uh, elements. So, you know, really I'd be taking four significant figures here and here. So these would result in four. It's not necessary to get that specific with it because you're going to end up ditching these numbers in the end anyway. Okay, so you can see that... <laughs> For every one mole of carbon, there's going to be double that for oxygen. But the way that I would make sure that that's correct is divide both of these numbers by 1.32. And you'll see that this gives you 1 and this gives you 2. So based on this information, there must be 1 carbon and 2 oxygens. So CO2 is the empirical formula. Now again, that could be the molecular formula. We just don't know. We need to know what the molar mass for the substance is overall. And then we could figure out what the molecular formula is for that substance. And so let's try this one here. Now this one's giving you different information still. This one says an oxide of chromium, ooh, fancy, is found to have the following uh, composition, 68.4% chromium and 31.6% oxygen. Determine the empirical formula. This is giving us the percent composition information. Now there's a, a relatively simple trick for this. And it's that if you assume that you have 100 grams of this sample, 
And you can make that assumption because you're just trying to figure out the proportion between the elements. Uh, it says a little bit more than two thirds of this is chromium and the remaining bit is oxygen. If you have a 100 gram sample, then wouldn't 68.4 grams of that be chromium and 31.6 grams of this be oxygen? The answer is yes. So now that we know we have masses, which is basically just swapping out that percent symbol for a lowercase g representing grams, then you can just use that information just like we did in the last problem. Convert them each to moles, divide by the smallest mole amount, and that should give you your proportion. So let's do it. Uh, chromium first, and then oxygen. Uh, chromium is 68.4 grams. Notice that percentage has just become a gram amount because I've assumed I have a 100 gram sample. And that's totally fair to do. Keep your eye on the prize. You're just trying to figure out the proportion between the elements. You could assume a one gram sample or a 20 gram sample. They're just not as useful as assuming 100 grams because then you can take the percentage and turn them into to mass amounts. So I want to convert uh, grams, 68.4 grams of uh, chromium. Chromium's uh, molar mass is 52. 52 grams is equal to one mole of chromium. So 68.4 over 52 gives me 1.32 moles of chromium. Same thing for oxygen, so 31.6 grams of oxygen. One mole of oxygen weighs 16 grams. So 31.6 over 16, 1.98. <clears throat> that is an M. Okay, so now I want to divide by 1.32 because that's the smaller number. And again, this is just our trick to get the whole number ratio. So I get 1 and 1.98 over 1.32 gives me 1.5. Oh no, what happens here? What happens if when we divide by our smallest mole amount, it doesn't actually give us whole numbers, but instead gives us another decimal like 1.5. Well, we're still trying to find the smallest ratio. And sometimes the smallest ratio doesn't include the number one. Sometimes there's a smaller ratio or the smallest ratio includes numbers bigger than one. What I mean is I have to double this number because that's the smallest whole number I could multiply both of these by to get this to be a whole number. If I just multiplied this by one, it wouldn't change. But if I multiplied this number by two, it would give me three. The thing though is that I have to maintain the same proportion between these elements. And so what I do to one thing, I also have to do to the other. I have to double this as well. And so let me kind of circle the information that's important to me at this moment. For every two chromium atoms, there are three oxygen atoms. Um, I can't go lower than a two and a three. That's, a, that's the lowest whole number ratio using this same proportion. Uh, and so, yeah, sometimes your uh, calculations are going to give you a number like 1.5 or 2.5 or 3.5. The quick way to fix that is just to double everything. Now, what happens if you get a number like 1.25 or 1.75? Well, in those situations, you'd have to quadruple everything because that's the smallest whole number that you could multiply by to get you a new whole number in that scenario. So I'm not sure that's going to pop up in this video, um, but it could pop up in life and now hopefully you're prepared. So what is the empirical formula for this? It's Cr2O3 and uh, don't forget that for ionic substances, which this is an ionic substance, that is the formula. Uh, so this is chromium 3 oxide. So there's that. All right, I do want to show you one more example, and this is where they're asking us to determine the molecular formula, which is the actual formula for the substance. It's really not too much different. Let's first figure out the empirical formula. They give us two elements here, carbon and hydrogen, so C and H, 82.66. Uh, now, they gave us percent, but again, I can just use that as a gram amount because I can assume that there's 100 grams of this sample of this CH compound. So 12.01 uh, grams of carbon on the bottom is equal to one mole. I'm kind of flying through this now because I'm assuming you know how to convert from grams to moles. So 82.66 over 12.01 gives me 
6.88 moles. For hydrogen, 17.34 grams. Hydrogen is an easy one to remember. It's 1.01 LOL grams. 17.34 uh, over 1.01 gives you 17.7 or 17.17. Okay, so now I have the mole amounts. I can just divide by the smallest number, which in this case is 6.88. This will give me 1. And 17.17 over 6.88 gives me 2.5. So here's another one where I'm going to have to double these in order to get the smallest ratio. So this will give me 2 atoms of carbon for every 5 atoms of hydrogen. The empirical formula is C2H5. Now it's possible that this is the molecular formula. Think about this. If you need to, pause the video for a second. Think about how you determine if this was the empirical, or I'm sorry, if this was the molecular or not, given that the molar mass of the molecular formula is 58.12 grams per mole. So pause it. How could you figure out if C2H5 was the molecular formula if you know that the molar mass of the molecular formula is 58.12 grams per mole? The answer is you have to see what the molar mass is for C2H5. If that matches 58.12 or pretty damn close to it, then you're in good shape. So let's figure this out then. Two carbons would be 24.02. So I'm going to find the molar mass for this. Uh, 2 times 12.01 is 24.02 plus 5 hydrogen. So that's 5 times 1.01. .01. I can tell you right now it's not going to give me 58, but I'll do it. 12.01 plus 5 times 1.01. Okay, 29.07 uh, grams per mole. That's the molar mass of C2H5. Now, the way to figure out what the molecular formula would be, first of all, the molecular formula is going to keep this same proportion between the elements. But if you'll notice, 29 is half of 58. And so what this means is that the molar mass or the molecular formula for this substance has just got to be double of everything in here. Um, here's another way to think about it. If you take the molar mass of the molecular formula, 58.12 grams per mole, and you divide it by the molar mass you've determined for the empirical formula, you should get 2. That'll be your factor, or about 2, but that'll be your factor that you want to uh, multiply all of the subscripts in your empirical formula by. Um, so this gives you about 2, and that means that the molecular formula is actually C4, because 2 times 2 is 4, H10, because 2 times 5 is 10. This is our substance. And if you'll notice, that's the substance that we began this video with. It's C4H10. A um, lot on the screen. And these can be somewhat tedious. I think students get faster at these as they do them more often. Um, the one thing I can tell you is that you're not going to necessarily get better at these if you don't practice them. Um, so I would make sure that you're practicing these types of problems. What I like about this is that this kind of reviews a lot of the mole unit. Uh, there's a you know, mass to mole conversion, there's a percent composition layer to this, and then also of course there's uh, empirical and molecular formulas. Understanding the difference between the two and uh, learning how to get between the two I think is really important. Thank you.